Um, let me, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Paolo Costa. Paolo is a principal researcher at MSR UK and an honorary lecturer at Imperial College London. Paolo's done a lot of impressive work and perhaps maybe one way that I can summarize the essence of his work is that his work is incredibly unique. You don't really see the kind of work that Paolo does in normal conferences. And so that's very inspiring to watch the way that he conducts research. Somehow he combines software and hardware and application together and then breaks boundaries and orthodoxies in a way that just wows the viewer. And so with that, Paolo, I'm very happy to have you here. The virtual floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Mania and Moya, for, for the nice words and also for the invitation to the workshop. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. It sounds you know, very exciting, uh, very exciting talk. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so um, what I, uh, I was thinking of when I uh, received the invitation and you know, given the, the scope of the workshop, I thought that I would describe something that is uh, very much work in progress. So I think the goal would be here to give you a, an overview of our current journey on how to think about the next generation networking to support machine learning work. So in a sense, we are complementing you know, what the previous speakers and also yesterday we were discussing and how we can build infrastructure to support this ever-growing, ever-increasing machine learning model. And as you guess from the title, and we think that optical network could be a very valuable asset in uh, to this quest. So, just at the beginning to start as a sort of you know, level setting, let's just think about you know, today's network. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, about the, the, the network, more or less, I think all of you are familiar uh, with uh, how we build data center networks today. And of course, different companies have different uh, approaches, but at a high level, we all use some variant of a multi tier switch network. Um, it's worth noting that uh, we use uh, copper cables typically within the rack, but outside the rack, they're all optical fiber because you cannot uh, propagate uh, electrical signals um, more than, say, one or two meters at today's speed. And, but then we use opt electrical switches for uh, forwarding packets. And so at every hop in this hierarchy, you will see that there are uh, transceivers that perform the optical to electrical uh, transition. Now, just for uh, you know, the purpose of this talk, let's just assume an hypothetical cluster. So this is not representative of anything specific that we have in Microsoft or uh, other companies, but just you know, it's a sort of thought experiment. So we assume we have 65,000 node cluster. We want to interconnect them in a non-blocking, uh, uh, using a non-blocking topology. And we assume about 32 megawatt of total compute power. So roughly half a kilowatt per node. Now, if you assume today's uh, speed, uh, so 100 gigabit, uh, roughly the network power is about two megawatt, a bit uh, south of that. Now, in the absolute term, this sounds like a big number. But relatively speaking, it's about you know, five, maybe five to 10%, depending how you count, of the overall cluster power. So definitely something to keep an eye on, but maybe not something you would lose your sleep. However, machine learning is really changing the equation here. And I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this graph. I saw, I'm sure you saw so many variations of this. But the key point that I want to stress here is the fact that we are long past the point in which we can host a single ML model onto a, sorry, we can host an ML model onto a single device. And so what it means that together with traditional data paradigm techniques, we also need to complement with uh, solutions like uh, pipeline parallelism or model parallelism in order to be able to train these uh, models in a reasonable time. And so now the network really become key because of course now as part of your, uh, not just at, at the end of when you want to aggregate, uh, but as part of your uh, uh, forward and uh, back propagation path, you need to have uh, high network bandwidth in order to be able to sustain the throughput and to make you know, this training of uh, large model and physics. And in fact, it's not a surprise that if you look across uh, all the major uh, or all the mainstream accelerators, and this is just the samples and there are more, there is a common uh, aspect that they all share, that is the fact that they all have uh, um, bandwidth in excess of uh, terabit. So for example, today, not in five years or not in about today, the latest uh, in BHGPUs, you can consume up to 2.4 terabit of bandwidth. But that would be about you know, 24 times more than uh, what you know, a traditional server, 100 gig server can do. 
And so now, if we go back to our uh, cluster before, and now we replace all the 65,000 nodes with accelerators, and we assume we want to interconnect all of them at full bandwidth in an unblocked way. Now, suddenly, the network power explodes. So now we are about 20 to 50 megawatts of power just coming from the network. Or in other terms, that would be about you know, 40 to 60 percent, which clearly means it's not feasible. And of course, there are solutions to address this today. So, for example, what you do is that you add over subscription, or perhaps you restrict the model parallelism at the size of the rack. Uh, for example, like in the case of NVIDIA, typically they have NV Link, so very high bandwidth within Iraq, and then they use uh, infinite band with uh, uh, higher subscription when you go in between racks. However, as we think of uh, the next generation, the challenge that we have is that machine learning models are ever changing. We don't know what are going to be the next one. And in a sense, we don't want to optimize the network based on today's setup. So what we really like to have is how we can provide the network that can be flexible, future-proof, in order to be able to sustain all this future work. So stepping back a second, where does this network power come from? And here I'm overly simplifying perhaps, but at the high level, there are two main components. There are the transceivers that, as I said, they operate the translation between the optical and the electrical signal. And then there are the switch agents themselves that are based on standard CMOS technology. Roughly, depending how you count, uh, it can be the power is roughly split between the two. And again, we shouldn't really fixate on you know, the exact numbers, but at the high level, you know, there, there are more or less you know, unequal uh, uh, contribution. So let's first focus on the first component, the transceivers. So today, we typically use pluggable transceivers, and I'm sure probably you saw them when you look at like a front panel on uh, a standard switch where you just plug all these uh, uh, transceivers within. Uh, this graph will consume about 25 picojoules per bit. And however, there is a lot of innovation happening. So across the industry, there is this trend that is called co-packaged optics, where the idea is to bring the optics component closer to the edge. And the main thing is that we want to minimize the, elect the length of the electrical traces, which ultimately result in much lower power. And again, just for the sake of the discussion, roughly, you know, we can think of uh, the power being uh, reduced by about a factor of 10. So going from 25 picojoules per bit to 2.5 picojoules per bit. And in fact, we also have a line of sight to how do we go to femtojoule transceiver, to sub picojoule. Well, this using, uh, for example, new uh, techniques looking at nanophotonics, minimization, or in general, like, you know, better integration, like for example, monolithic uh, uh, integration of um, silicon photonics. And if people are interested, that there was a recent uh, a workshop at OHC, which really go deep into some of these new techniques. Now, of course, this is great because now if we go back to our scenario, I'm just focusing on the NVIDIA just as, a, as an example. We see that as we go from today at 25 picojoules per bit, if you reduce the power of 2.5 picojoules per bit, we got a significant reduction in the amount of power. However, you probably start getting where I'm going that as we further reduce the transceiver power, there is a big elephant in the room. There is the switch power. So after a certain point, just focusing on the transceiver power, it doesn't, uh, you, get, you start getting diminishing return. Now, in the past, the people were not really worried too much about the power because of the switches, because you could just rely on more slow. So every two years, uh, you typically were getting you know, a switch that has twice the bar before the previous one, at roughly the same power. Now, however, as you know, while uh, on the density side, uh, probably more slow, I still like in a few generation ahead, meaning that you can still double the density as you go from one process of size to the next one. In terms of power, it's now becoming clear that the more slow has come to an end. Because in fact, as you move from one to another, the power is not half. And this has to do with the fact that as you go to smaller process of size, you start having a, a current leakage. And also that some of the components that use, for example, services that are based on analog electronics, which doesn't really scale as much as the uh, digital counterpart. And so what it means is that we cannot just simply sit back and relax, but now we need to be proactive and try to think of what could be a new solution in order to address uh, that. And as I said, it's not a problem in the very short term, but as a research community, we should really look about you know, what could be the next generation of how. So the specific direction that we have been looking at is, can we uh, use optical switching? So why optical switching? Well, optical switching provides two main benefits. 
The first one is that uh, by replacing electrical switches with optical switches, you don't have to pay for the power of the electrical switches. But second, also since they operate in the optical domain, you also reduce the number of transceivers. So you have a double effect in terms of your power reduction. You affect both the switch side, but also at least in part, the transceiver side. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, well, based on what you said, that it should be a no-brainer. I mean, we should just you know, take off the switches, put in the network, and why should even wasting our time listening to this? I mean, it should be something that you know, industry should have done already. The challenge, however, is that uh, as we look at like, off-the-shelf components, the only one that we have available is typically based on 3D NEMs that are reasonably slow. In the sense that you know, the time it takes to switch from one configuration to another, which is what you need when you want, for example, to change the full wording of the packet, is still operating in the range of you know, tens of milliseconds. And this may be okay for some of today's workload that maybe they use on data and you know, some uh, limited form of model parallelism. But as we look at future workloads, and again, this at this moment is just speculation because the jury is still out there on what would be the new workload that are coming up. And in fact, you know, part of our job is really trying to enable new workers that are not possible today, that are not even conceivable today. For example, it seems that there is a trend towards getting for data dependent flow, something like, for example, MOE or mixed or for export. And so for this one, we really need to start bringing the latency down. And there has been a lot of work, in fact, that, you know, both our group and also Miners group are looking at some of these technologies. And there are different technologies you can use that can achieve the fast stability. But the challenge is how to bring this into an actually something practical that you can use and that can be uh, deployed at scale. But the second challenge, which is actually to me like the biggest hurdle to the adoption uh, of optical switches, is really the fact that optical switches is not a plug-in replacement. So for uh, the transceiver part, the fact that you move from pluggable to, uh, for example, co-package optics, uh, it should, it's not really something that impacts the rest of the stack. In fact, it's completely transparent. So you only change a physical layer, but the rest of the stack is not even aware that there's been a change. The challenge with optical switches is that they fundamentally provide a different abstraction. So they don't have buffers, which is great because it means that you don't have queuing delays and you get speed of light. But it's also bad because it means now your system needs to become synchronous or it needs to effectively move from a packet switch to a circuit switch abstraction. And so what this means is that you have uh, number of uh, implications on the rest of the stack, the NIC, the network stack, the management layer, application, and so on. And so really when you start thinking of a switch, you need to start having like a sort of cross stack attitude and really think all the different challenges at this point. Now, what you might be tempted to do is that, well, we should really see this as, you know, the upper one are more for the networking community. Then there are some changes like time synchronization or clock net recovery that is just for the hardware. And then the optics people should just worry about the optical switch. And what I would like to challenge this uh, attitude is that, uh, at least based on our experience, to really get an efficient and effective uh, solution, you really need to break the barriers across the layers. And this graph is what uh, Maya was thinking at the beginning, where we really need to think about across the stack and really trying to see the system as a whole and optimize the different components holistically. Perhaps you know, moving some of the complexity up to the stack or down to the stack. Now, just to give a bit more meat to what I'm saying, I'm just gonna uh, present a few things that we have done in the context of uh, Project Sirius. That was one of the optical switch technology that we developed in our lab in Cambridge. But I don't want you to focus too much on this specific technology because I think in general, we think that many of the lessons that we learned here are also applicable also to other technologies as well. So just at the high level, the technology that we use to do the switching is called wavelength switching. And it's a very simple. So it's based on two components. The first one is called AWGR, but despite the fan's name, the principle is very simple. So it's a passive component. You can think like a piece of glass. So there are no transistors or buffer or power going in, but it has the property like a prism that uh, depending on the wavelength or the color of the signal that is coming in, it would be deflected or routed onto a different port. So for example, if I send like a red pass, it would go on port one. And if I send a green one, it would go on port two. And then I can combine this with uh, a fast tunable laser. And so for example, if I'm talking to Mania, 
I'm going to select red, and then I want to talk to Mario. I don't need to change the encoding of the packet or anything. I just need to switch it to green. And the packet will just naturally, you know, just exploiting this natural effect, flow to the correct destination. Now, I don't have the time to really go in details about you know, what we did. If people are interested, of course, I mean, we can discuss more uh, you know, during the Q&A or you know, we can also read more details in the paper that we published last year. But just to give you a sense of the various things that we have to go through. So first of all, we have to design a laser that was able to um, switch into a nanosecond, because if you look at off the shelf to normal laser, they switch, they're still switching in milliseconds. So I think we'll still be back in the sort of, you know, 3D NAMS regime. So we have to design our own chip. And um, this is an example of the chip that we fabricated and we tested in our lab. Uh, we also need to think about CDR. Uh, locking time. So one thing is about uh, how fast you can switch the light, but also the second one is uh, how fast you can recover the signal. And what it turns out that yes, you can uh, switch the light very fast, but then it may take you know hundreds of nanoseconds to start recovering the signal. And then of course that means that you know, it's completely useless to have a very fast switch to start with. And so we also have to develop a method to have a, a sub nanosecond locking time. Uh, time synchronization, and this is where we really need to think to the stack because, uh, well, if you have a very fast optical switch, it means that uh, you need to have somehow some notion of schedule because it's a circuit switch abstraction. But that means that you also need to agree on a time. Because, for example, if you say, well, uh, the talk today starts at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time, but my uh, watch is 10 minutes or 15 minutes late, I can, of course, this is not going to be useful. Uh, then before I was a bit cheating because I was saying, well, you just uh, switch the laser to when you want to talk to a different uh, endpoint. But in reality, you only have a limited number of wavelengths. You have about you know, 100, 200 wavelengths. So how do we scale to hundreds of thousands of servers? That was one of the challenges we have solved. Also, well, you have a very fast switch, but there is no way you can schedule at the scale of a full cluster in such time. So we also need to come up with a way in which we can go away without a, a proactive schedule. And finally, we cannot just use TCP because again, we have no buffers and in general, all the dynamics are different. So we also have to come up with a new congestion control. Now, of course, you know, I'm very proud. We are all very proud of our baby. And, you know, we think, you know, it's a very nice and uh, elegant solution. But I'm not going to lie. There is a lot of complexity that we built into the system. And also in general, there are trade-offs that we have to make. For example, to achieve this schedule design, we are building up some of the throughput in uh, under some circumstances. But the beauty of when we think about uh, in uh, AI uh, interconnected machine learning is that we can make some additional assumptions. And this is where I'm really thinking about thinking across the stack in the application that can remove some of the complexity and uh, give even better performance. So for example, in the case of the scheduler, well, the compiler can be the scheduler because uh, ML flows are much more predictable than in general case. So Sirius was designed to address the general uh, unpredictable uh, uh, networking, uh, uh, like you know, cloud-based application where you don't really have much insight on what the application will do. But inside ML, the degree of predictability is much higher. Or also, and for example, like you know, the previous uh, speaker, in a sense, you know, was uh, could be a good connection, like to to discuss together. Is uh, well, typically for applications and networking, you really want to get to the very lowest bit array possible. Typically, we target uh, ten to the minus twelve. But in uh, ML application, usually noise is actually beneficial. In fact, sometimes you actually you want to add some noise to avoid overfitting. So that would be an interesting co-design opportunity. In uh, well, maybe we can relax. Our bit error rate uh, target and effectively as, you know, assume that there are going to be some uh, errors, but that's okay because the application itself is going to be robust. Maybe you can even benefit from, the bit, uh, from uh, some uh, additional noise into the system. And finally, for example, in terms of time synchronization, so time synchronization is something that we had to build in order to support our optical switch infrastructure. But once you have a nanosecond time synchronization, maybe you can expose this to the application. And so think about you know, building a discrete system completely synchronous. So like a few years ago, there was a paper at Porto S that was making the point about the synchronous system. And here we can go, we can make this practical and we can go even down in terms of accuracy because we can achieve potential nanosecond accuracy. So you can have effectively all your FPGAs or your accelerator all part of the same clock domain. And of course, I mean, there could be many more. And I'm not saying that all of these ideas are, uh, you know, 
have potential. In fact, you know, we have started to explore some of them. But this is a sort of thinking that we would like, you know, to uh, share with you and, you know, try all together as a community to brainstorm. What are new opportunities that when you start thinking, when you break the barrier, when you start thinking across layer, can bring to the system design? So another nice uh, thing about optical switching is now if we go back to the previous uh, graph about transceivers, now it does make sense to go down in transceiver power because in fact now we effectively remove the switch power and so everything is dominated by the transceivers. And so if you can actually scale beyond the picojoule uh, uh, barrier, what you can do is that potentially you can now enable future scaling because for example, you can uh, assume that you can add even more bandwidth that uh, what you know, the previous calculation were assuming, or you can have more accelerators because you have more power or uh, spare power that you can use, or a combination of both. And I'm just gonna give like a, a quick sample because this is something that we only recently started. So again, they're still very early on in the process, but there are two ways that we're currently going after this. The first one is doing device innovation. And there has been a lot of work recently, the community that we are looking to it and see like, you know, we can leverage it on nanophotonics plus more than But there is also, and this, as you can imagine, something that uh, um, it's, uh, it's really close to my heart, but system innovation. And one of the things, for example, we're looking at is going from what we call fat channel to thin channels. So the idea is that today, typically the way uh, we build transceivers is that you have an ASIC, ASIC typically have a very wide parallel bus, typically operate one or two gigabit, and then you have a service that takes multiple channels and one or two gigabit, and then bump up into a single serial channel at very high speed. So 112 gigabit, probably the next generation, 20 to 124. It's not clear whether you can go further because at some point you just go into some fundamental limit on how fast you can modulate the signal. And so our approach is that, well, actually, why don't we do it the other way around? Rather than trying to have this race uh, to the top, let's go race to the bottom. So let's remove the services completely. And let's try to go parallel channels all the way from the ASICs to the modulator over the fiber and then photo detector and then the ASIC. Because the advantage here is that you can get uh, you know, lower power because you remove the services. Also can simplify the backend because now you can operate at a much lower speed, for example, like you know, a few gigabit as opposed to one gigabit. But on the other hand, you also need to be careful about because now we're also making you know, the packaging a wide complex. So this is why you know you will need to think at the full pitch. But what excites me about you know also this opportunity is that now suddenly your endpoint, rather than having just one uplink, now it has hundreds, potentially thousands of uplinks. And so how does this change the next design when you have effectively such a high radius endpoint? For example, new topology. Uh, fault tolerance, congestion control. Again, I think, you know, there could be something uh, that we can explore here. So I'm gonna stop here, but I just want to know if you perhaps, you know, can remember only one slide from, uh, from my talk is the following, that we start from uh, the requirements of large scale ML training and uh, the desire to support the future and still to, uh, yet to be developed uh, ML models. And so we look into optical switching and the idea of you know, how we achieve power efficient endpoints and specifically you know, thin channel endpoints. But this also open up new opportunities, for example, in having like a synchronous interconnect or designing ML specific topologies, which then we can feed back at the application layer. So now we can also influence the way in which we design this ML training to take advantage of this new other capability. And then we go through this cycle again. Um, I just want to stop uh, with uh, one last um, um, comment. So, so far in this talk, I've only talked about the network, but as part of this uh, effort of looking at you know, how we can leverage optics uh, technologies for the cloud infrastructure, for next generation cloud infrastructure, at MSR Cambridge, we have a broader effort that is looking at also the other domain, for example, like storage. There is Project Silica that perhaps some of you have, uh, have seen um, some of the videos online or some of the news, which is about how we can actually use the femtosecond lasers and ship glass in order to provide a very durable and very low cost uh, storage medium. And uh, also more recently, also we are looking also at and looking how we can use the optics technology in order to accelerate some of our complete work. But across all these teams, the common, uh, uh, across all this project, the common team is really this idea of interdisciplinary and cross layer cross-start approach, because we think that, uh, in our opinion, this uh, is uh, 
a very effective and uh, you know, promising way to really uh, you know, bring us to this uh, post more post more slow world. Okay, and on this one, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and happy to take question or to discuss uh, further. Thanks a lot, Carlo. Really, really insightful. All right. Okay, let me read the one question from chat for you. Is this achievement? Can this achievement go to operation for industrial automation, fiber optic modulator in future? I think the question is about can is it maybe deployable or is it a future technology? Yeah, no, no it's, it's, really? yeah so it's, it's a very good question. I should have said that. So all of what I said is at the moment at the research stage. Of course, you know, we are working with our you know, uh, product teams, uh, colleagues, and uh, I try to understand what the requirement, but at the moment, this is just in a research phase. And I think, you know, it's still going to, as I said, it's the beginning of a journey. And we still need to de-risk uh, a number of uh, uh, mm. challenges and also including also practical like deployment channel management challenge before we can make this into a, into a product. Mm -hmm. But we think that at least at the start, you know, there are some promising uh, opportunities that we think as a research community uh, is worth exploring together. Makes sense, makes sense. There's another question for you. Um, says, I feel like we are revisiting optics circa 2000. How much do tunable lasers cost these days? Yeah, it's, it's a very good point. And actually, again, it's something that uh, I think, you know, it's not something to be ashamed of, but I think, you know, there is a lot of value in revisiting uh, old ideas. I think, you know, mm. there were some old ideas that at the time was not just right because other technology was not mature or maybe because, you know, the work at that time didn't require that technology. But I think, you know, there are some very good ideas that has been explored in the past and uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. what we, in general, what we're trying to do is trying to revisit them, but taking also advantage of uh, the recent uh, uh, advances in both in the hardware as well as the work. Uh, in terms of the specific cost, I can't really comment because yeah. it's something that, you know, is confidential, but we are working, uh, we are looking into that and we are working with suppliers in order to really meet the, the cost. Because, I mean, I, I talk about mm -hmm. power, but of course, I mean, in general, what we want to do is try to minimize the TCO, which is the total cost of ownership. Thank you, thank you. Um, the follow-up says, returning to old ideas is important, especially when the solution is almost a no architecture. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. Uh, and in general, uh, maybe just one comment I want to make. Um, and my, I know that this is something you know, we, we have been uh, you know, working together on this. It's really trying to break the barrier, not just uh, across the layers, but also across communities. So it's very mm -hmm. difficult to bring people from different communities together. And so in a sense, I'm really praise the effort you're you doing with this workshop and really taking people. Because there is a, there's a lot of value in just people coming from different worlds and really talking together. And it's challenging because you need to agree on a common terminology. You need to agree on a common incentive. But once you do it, you really unlock uh, the power. And for example, we have seen like, you know, as you know, we, you know, a workshop at the OFC, at SIGFOM, at uh, EPOC. I mean, really, when, once you start breaking the barrier, then, you know, yeah, the amount of innovation and ideas is really, you know, unprecedented, I think. Totally agree with you. This is sort of the purpose of this workshop, to bring people with different backgrounds here. Um, let me ask you one question, just jumping up on the previous uh, question. What do you think is possible today, with today's technology, um, you were looking at the MEMS and maybe, can we do anything with today's technology? I think so. I think, you know, there is already some perhaps low angle fruit that uh, mm -hmm. can, be, can be taken today. Again, I think it, it requires, you know, uh, sorry, I, I know I keep repeating myself, but it really requires effectively having ML people sitting together with systems mm -hmm. people and networking people and everything. Because in a sense, I think that uh, if you just look at, okay, I take today's workload, uh, replace with remains. Yes, maybe you get some advantages, but I think it's a missed opportunity. But if instead you there is an effort from both parties to say, okay, let's see how I can change my work and let's see how I can change my mm -hmm. network, you know, to take advantage. I think that already today there could be some interesting opportunities. Totally agree with you. We should we should catch up on that. I, I would love to discuss more. Okay. Oh, there's one more question. Nanosecond speed switching was a challenge. We saw at Intel. Has the situation improved? Who makes the switches of this type? Well, yes, uh, but how does? Questions. 
<laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it's a big challenge. As I said, one of the sort of you know uh, big uh, hurdles that we had to solve when we look into this process is how to build the nanosec on tunable laser. So we had to come up with our own design, and which at the moment is clear like it's a research prototype, so it's nowhere. Yeah, for the mm -hmm. There are also, I want to be fair, there are also other efforts, for example, using SOA based switches, MCI based switches, uh, which also can achieve now second. They have different properties in terms of power consumption and loss and, and so on. Um, as far as I know, that they're all still like you know, research for the type, some more advanced mm -hmm. than, uh, than others, but they're not uh, mainstream uh, yet. Let me add this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, it would be nice to put the uh, URLs to your paper. And yeah. in the chat so folks can follow up. Okay, absolutely. And uh, there are also references, you know, to other, uh, you know, similar nanosecond switching units so people can, mm, can awesome. follow on. Awesome. All right, wonderful, lovely. I think we are about done for the this part of the talk. Thank you so much, Paolo.